In this video I'm going to cover equilibrium calculations and ice tables without using the quadratic equation. So we've been talking about equilibrium and equilibrium is a state that's reached when the rate of the reverse action reaction and the rate of the the forward reaction are equal. So remember when we start out with for example a lot of initial reactant and we don't have any product then at the very beginning the rate of the reverse reaction is zero. Here's the rate of the forward reaction, one over, two over, nothing has come, no reverse reaction has happened yet. I've only had two reactant molecules cross the boundary. We need to, oh, now the reverse reaction occurred, forward reaction's occurring. We might be at equilibrium already. So equilibrium is the point at which the concentrations don't change. Here we had another one move from the forward side to the reverse side, but then one moved from the reverse side back here where the reverse reaction occurred. So, so far we've had about two or three product particles at a time. So we watch this reaction for a while and we see after we run it for a while, what do the concentrations of products look like? Well, this hasn't changed for a long time. I've had three particles over here. Oh, look, just as one, just as it was about to become four, one bounced back. Oh, now it's four particles over here. So now I have four particles over here. So this is going to change back and forth because the forward reaction is still occurring. These particles are still bouncing into each other and they're crossing the activation energy threshold and reactant becomes product. And simultaneously, product becomes reactant. The product particles are still bumping into each other, and as they bump into each other, they're going to move back this way, and they're going to become reactant particles. And the, the, both chemical reactions are always occurring forwards and backwards. Equilibrium is the, the point reached when the rate is equal, when they're moving forwards and backwards at the same rate, so that the, the concentration of products looks like it doesn't change. So look, I've, I've, as, the, as I've been talking, we've been gaining some more particles, but look, now we're back down to four back up to five over here on the product side. Now we're up to six on the product side. So you can see that the forward reaction is occurring faster than the reverse reaction because I keep accumulating product. But here at some point when I get more and more uh, product particles, the rate of the reverse reaction starts to speed up. More and more, since there's more and more particles over on the product side, more and more of them can make it over to the reactant side more frequently. So here, you know, the equilibrium is going to keep going back and forth, but the equilibrium is a function of the how high these two platforms are relative to each other. So if I make this platform really high, obviously I can't have a negative activation energy, so let's put this back up a little bit. There we go. So if I have a really high uh, my, my reactants have a very high potential energy and my products have a very low potential energy and this is a very exothermic reaction that's occurring, then what's likely to happen is that all of my reactants are going to cross this barrier eventually and it's going to be very hard for them to get back because the space that they have to travel to go back is going to be very, very large compared to the space they have to travel to go forwards. So when the potential energy between reactant and product is very great, the equilibrium lies on the product side, which means that there will be more product particles at equilibrium than reactant particles. And the opposite is true if I'm running an endothermic reaction like this. If I change the energy profile, um, well, I just cooled these down a lot. So now that I cooled them down, they don't have enough energy to get up over the activation barrier. But as I warm this up and I add some more heat to both sides, um, now we can see that the energy difference between reactant and product is causing the reverse to be true. So now as, as I give these product particles eventually enough energy to get over that activation barrier for the forward reaction to occur, eventually all of these particles or a majority of them are going to move over here because the distance they have to move to go, forward, to go backwards in this case is very small and the distance they have to move to go forwards, the barrier they have to overcome to go forwards is very large. So, um, and I guess the last situation we'll look at, we, had, we have high reactant, low product, or high product and low reactant, or we can look at a situation where the potential energy of reactant and product is about equal, and then 
we can see that the concentration of reactant and product particles is going to be about the same. So the energy, the potential energy of reactant and product has to do with whether at equilibrium I'm going to have more product particles, more reactant particles, or an equal amount of product and reactant if these are about equal in energy. So this is, this is the kind of, these are the kinds of questions we're asking when we do equilibrium concentrations. We're going to have an initial reaction. Let's reset this. And the reaction is going to say, okay, if I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 reactant particles, and the um, equilibrium constant for this reaction, K, is whatever, right? We'd write the equilibrium constant for the reaction down. Oops. K, the equilibrium constant, let's say, is 100. So once we know the, e the initial concentration, 10 reactant par particles, and we know the equilibrium constant, what K is, then I can calculate how many product particles are there going to be. What is this number of red particles going to be when I come to equilibrium? Or conversely, if I know the equilibrium constant K, and I know the equilibrium concentration, I know how many red ones there are, then I can move backwards and calculate how many green ones did I start with. Or, conversely, if I know how many green ones I have initially, and I know how many red ones I have at equilibrium, um, rather if I know the equilibrium concentration of both of these, green and red, then I can calculate e k, the equilibrium constant. So what I'm getting at is that all of these equations that we're going to look at in the next couple of parts of this chapter, the equilibrium chapter, have to do with how much reactant particle I start with. I can calculate that. How much uh, particles, what's the concentration of product and reactant at equilibrium? Or what's the equilibrium constant? So for any equation that I'm looking at, having a form like this, and if I had three reactants, I could add a C over here, and if I had three products, I could add an E over here, and so on. So just for a generic reaction like this, this I'm going to need to calculate the reaction quotient, Q. And reaction quotient is just products over reactants raised to their stoichiometric coefficient, but the concentrations that go into this calculation are initial concentrations. Little i equals initial. And we're also going to need to calculate the equilibrium constant, like we looked at in the last section, K. And K equals products over reactants. The same, it looks exactly the same as Q. The only difference between Q and K is with Q, I'm looking at initial concentrations before the reaction has come to equilibrium, when I just start. And with K, I'm looking at equilibrium concentrations. I can only put equilibrium concentrations in here after the reaction has been going for a really, really, really long time and it seems to have stopped, what are the concentrations then? When I put those in, I calculate K. If I, if I have Q and um, I, have, I don't have any products yet and I have just started the reaction, then I know that I'm not at equilibrium yet. And so then I would have initial reactants. Or if I start a reaction and I only let it go for like three minutes or you know some sh short amount of time, and then I, I measure the, the concentration at that point, it's still probably not at equilibrium. Because remember, for a reaction to come to equilibrium, it usually takes time, depending on how fast the reaction is. But when I start a reaction, it's going to take 10 minutes, an hour, a day, a week. It's going to take some amount of time to come to equilibrium. Um, so the concentrations that I start with are not going to be the concentrations I end with. And the amount of time it takes is going to be different for different reactions. So really, that's the only difference between Q and K. Are the concentrations that I'm putting in this calculation, are, am I at equilibrium? No. Then what I'm really calculating is Q. The concentrations I'm putting into this equation, are those equilibrium concentrations? Yes. Then what I'm really calculating is K. So how it's easy to generally calculate equilibrium or initial concentrations. We can look at somewhere we calculate these. But usually, initial concentrations are given to you in the problem. So the problem will say, the initial concentration of C is 1. The initial concentration of D is 2. What's the equilibrium concentration of A or something? And, and they'll, we'll be given initial concentrations. And we'll be trying to solve for equilibrium concentrations. That's generally the way that it goes. So when we're trying to solve for an equilibrium concentration so that we can plug these values in, 
so that we can solve for k. Then I use my initial concentration plus or minus some factor x. And x is if I start with 10 green balls and at equilibrium I have 9 green balls, then x was 1. It was the shift that I needed to reach equilibrium. So x is, has to do with what the equilibrium constant is. Am I going to have more products? Is C going to be heavy? Do I have more products at equilibrium? Or is, is uh, reactants A and B, are these going to be bigger at equilibrium? So we can compare Q and K to figure out if we are at equilibrium or not. And if we are, we can calculate what these equilibrium concentrations are going to be if we know the value of K. So that's kind of the idea here. These are the equations that we're going to look at. We'll either be calculating Q, or our concentration initial, or K, or concentration equilibrium. So let's look at a couple of these problems. A solution with an initial concentration of I2 equals 1 times 10 to the minus third molar, an initial concentration of I minus of 1 times 10 to the minus 3 molar, and equilibrium concentration of I2 equals 6.61 times 10 to the minus 4, what is the equilibrium constant? So here we're being asked to solve for the equilibrium constant. And remember the equilibrium constant equals, we just saw, C times C, or C to the C power times D to the raised to the D power times a raised to the a power times b raised to the b power. So when we fit that into our specific equation here, c, I only have c, I don't have d, I only have one product. So I have i3 minus, and the stoichiometric coefficient for that is 1. And then I divide that by a times b. So a is i2 and the coefficient is 1, and I minus, and the coefficient is 1. So raised, each of these raised to the 1 power. So the last thing I have to remember, since it's asking me for Q, or excuse me, for K and not Q, is that these are equilibrium concentrations. So what am I given right now? I have an initial concentration and an initial concentration here, and then I2, I have an equilibrium concentration. So I need to find, I have this, the equilibrium concentration of I2. I need to find the equilibrium concentration of these two species so that I can solve for K. I have the initial concentration of this one. I don't have any information on this one. So how do we go about solving a problem like this? Well, what we have to realize is that if I know the equilibrium concentration of this, then I know that that number is actually related to this and this, right? Because this is a 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. So if I have, uh, I'm talking about a balanced reaction, then if I have 10 of these, then I'm going to have, you know, for every 10 of these and 10 of these, I'm going to make 10 of these. It's a 1 to 1 to 1. For 20 of these plus 20 of these, I'll make 20 of these. So the amount of this that I have is related to the amount of this that I have and the amount of this that I have by those stoichiometric coefficients. So even though I don't have any information on I3 equilibrium, all, it's only given information on I2, I minus, I don't have anything on I3, it, I really can intuit what that's going to be because it's related to whatever this ends up being. They're all related. So the way that we keep track of this information when we're doing equilibrium uh, calculations is what's called an ice table. So an ice table, we look at the initial concentration, we look at the change in the concentration, and we look at the equilibrium concentration. And the way that we keep track of this is by making this an arithmetic problem. So the initial concentration is for I2, 1 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. And for I minus, the initial concentration is 1 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. And I3, generally, unless it tells you that you have an initial concentration of product, you usually don't, because 
when you start a reaction, you haven't made any product yet. This is initial. I have A plus B. I haven't made any C yet. Zero molar. So um, we write our initial concentrations in the first row. And then my change in concentration, this has to do with whether the reaction moves forward or backwards. Am I going to consume reactant or am I going to create more reactant? And it has to do with the stoichiometry of the reaction, whether it's a 1 to 1 to 1 ratio or a 1 to 2 to 1 or a 3 to 2 to 1 or whatever the stoichiometric ratio may be. That's tied up in this C, what C is. So first we have to answer, am I going to get more of these reactants when I start this reaction? Or am I going to get less of these reactants when I start the reaction? Am I going to get more of this when I start the reaction? Or am I going to get less of this when I start the reaction? So um, we have to figure out whether the reaction is going to move forward according to what I start with, or whether the reaction is going to move backwards according to what I start with. So there's a really good trick, which is whenever I start with zero, we know that I can't have less than zero. So if I start with zero product, there's no way for the reaction to move backwards because I would have to have some product for that product to go this way and turn into reactant. So if, I ever, if any of my reactants or products are ever zero, then generally the reaction moves toward that zero to make it bigger. It can't possibly move away from that zero. So that's an important question to ask because when I figure out what is the change in equilibrium, or the change in concentration, products are either going to get bigger or smaller, and the opposite is going to happen to the reactant, or the, the, I said that backwards, the reactants are either going to get bigger or smaller, and the opposite will happen to the product. So in this situation, I have, um, let's just for, because these numbers are not easy to talk about, I'm just going to say 10, right? I have 10 of these, I have 10 of these, and I have zero of these. So at the beginning of the reaction, how many of, how many of these am I going to have at equilibrium? Less than 10, right? They're, I have 10, 10, and zero. Well, when this reaction's done, I'm probably going to have less than 10 of these, and I'm probably going to have more than zero of these. So the first thing we can say about the change is that this is going to be minus. I'm going to lose some of it. This is going to be minus. I'm going to lose some of it. And this is going to be plus. I'm going to gain some of it. So we have to kind of draw a line here on our, action, on our arrow and separate reactants from products. If I'm going to lose reactant minus some amount, minus some amount, then I'm gaining some amount of product. And in fact, the amount I'm gaining is a function of the, the ratio, the stoichiometric ratio here. So this is a 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. So I'm going to lose some amount. I'm going to lose x. How much of this am I going to lose? x. And how much of this am I going to gain? x. I don't know what the amount is yet, but I do know that if I start with 0 over here, the only way I can go is up. The only place to go is up from there. So I must be gaining something. And if I'm gaining something here, I must be losing something here. So this is where we start. We put our initial concentration from our problem. We write our change according to the coefficients, the stoichiometry of the reaction. And now I can try to figure out what's my equilibrium concentration. Well, I just treat this like an arithmetic problem. So 1 times 10 to the minus 3 molar minus x. That's my equilibrium concentration after I figure out what x is. What's my equilibrium concentration here? 1 times 10 to the minus 3 molar minus x. And what's my equilibrium concentration here? 0 molar, what I started with, plus x, whatever I'm going to gain as this reaction comes to equilibrium. All right, so I already know that I2 is 6.61 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. So I know, I'm running out of space here, so I'm going to, oh, you know what, I'll just do this. So I know that um, my equilibrium concentration of I2 
equals 1 times 10 to the minus 3 oops, minus 3 molar minus x. And if I know what x is, then I can solve for this concentration and I can solve for this concentration. I need to figure out what x is. So how do I figure out what x is? Well, I know what I2 equilibrium concentration is. That I'm given that in uh, the problem up above. So hold on a second. Let me write it down again. A bit clumsy here. Let's see. 6.61 times 10 to the minus 4, it says, is the equilibrium concentration. 6.61 times 10 to the minus 4 molar is my equilibrium concentration of I2. So if I'm trying to solve for x, then I know that 6.61 times 10 to the minus 4 molar equals 1 times 10 to the minus 3 molar minus x. Now I just solve for x. So if I add x to both sides and then subtract this from both sides, then I get x equals 1 times 10 to the minus 3 molar minus 6.61 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. So that gives me 3.39 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. All right, so now I solved for x. So remember what, what that means is that now that I know what x is, I can come back and plug x in for these. So I know that the equilibrium concentration of I2 is going to be the same as the equilibrium concentration of as I minus because these are the same expressions. And the concentration of I3 minus is just going to be X. So let's see, here's my E. This is what I need to solve the problem here. So now we're trying to solve K EQ. What's the equilibrium constant? It's I3 minus equilibrium divided by I2 equilibrium times I minus equilibrium. Okay, I3 is 0 plus x, which is really just x, right? 0 plus x is I3 equilibrium. That's what it's right here. The equilibrium concentration of I3 is 0 plus x. The, I th the equilibrium concentration of I2, I already know what that is. They told me what that is. It's 6.61. And since these expressions are the same, then that means that the uh, equilibrium concentration of I minus is also the same. So then I can just say squared, because it's going to be 6.61 times 10 to the minus 4 times 6.61 times 10 to the minus 4. Right? And x is this number here, 3.39 times 10 to the minus 4 molar over 6.61 times 10 to the minus 4 molar squared. Seven point seven five.
five nine times ten two. All right, so this is an example of a problem where I'm asked what KEQ is and I'm given one of the equilibrium concentrations and I have to figure out what the other equilibrium concentrations are by solving for X. Another variation of this problem might be solve for the equilibrium constant the equilibrium concentration of I3 and I2 and I- is such and such and such. Well that's really easy. If they give you the equilibrium concentrations of these species, all we have to do is plug them in and solve for KEQ. That's easy. But if they only give me one of these equilibrium concentrations and they give me some initial concentrations, then I'm going to have to set up this ice table. And we're going to have to put our initial concentrations in, set up our X, what is our change going to be according to the stoichiometry, Put, make a, um, some mathematical phrase that tells us what the equilibrium concentration is going to be, but it's not a number, and then we have to solve for x. So um, this is the first. This is the first iteration of this kind of problem. Let's look at another kind. What is the equilibrium concentration of HF if the initial concentration of H2 is 1 molar and F2 is 1 molar? So now, in this question, we're given KEQ, but we don't know any equilibrium concentrations. We only have an initial and KEQ. So now, if we have initial and KEQ, we can find equilibrium. If we have initial and equilibrium, we can find KEQ. If we have KEQ and equilibrium, we can find initial. You see, there's, those are the three variables in this equation that we use um, during equilibrium calculations. So let's uh, set up our ice table. Initial, change, equilibrium. Put a line between our reactants and products so we may remember that they have to be the change is going to be the opposite for each of those. I have initial concentration of H2 is 1 molar. Initial F2 is 1 molar. And my initial HF is 0 molar. So which direction is this reaction going to go? Well, like we had just explored, whenever I have 0 product, I can't have less than zero, so it's impossible for this reaction to go this way. I don't have anything there. It can't go that way. It must be going this way. But it's not always so clear cut because sometimes they're not all zero. So what we're really doing is we're calculating Q. So Q equals, for this reaction, it, remember it, it's the same expression as the equilibrium constant. We just put in initial concentrations instead of equilibrium concentrations. H2 times F2. So here's what it looks like. If we put in our initial concentrations here, then I have 0 squared 1 times 1. So 0 over 1. 0 over 1 equals 0. So if Q equals 0 and K equals 1.53, then what we can say is that K is greater than Q. Or Q is less than K. Right? We have this relationship now between where we start initially. What's our initial starting point? Well, 0 when I calculate it. And what's my equilibrium ratio? 1.53. So frankly, I'm pretty close to equilibrium, actually. If I calculate that where I'm at, my, my reaction quotient is 0, and my equilibrium is 1.53, I'm already pretty close to that number. But what do I have to do to get there? Q has to get bigger, right? Q is too small. Q is less than K. So if Q is too small, it's 0, and I have to, it has to equal 1.53 before I get to equilibrium. Because remember, when Q equals K, then we're at equilibrium. That's what that means. 
equilibrium. So Q has to get bigger. It's at zero. It needs to get to 1.53. Remember that fundamentally Q equals concentration of products over concentration of reactants. So if Q is too small right now, and I need Q to get bigger, then the way to make this number bigger is to make either the reactants get smaller or the products get bigger, right? If the numerator gets bigger, then Q gets bigger. If the denominator gets smaller, then Q gets bigger. So how do we make the products larger and the reactants smaller? We move the reaction forward, right? When the reaction moves forward, then what happens? The reactant number gets smaller and the product number gets bigger. So when that reactant number gets smaller and the product number gets bigger, eventually Q is going to equal 1.53 and when Q equals 1.53 I'm at equilibrium. So we can say that when I have zero product it makes sense that the reaction is going to go forward. But this doesn't have to just be an intuitive kind of exercise. I can mathematically say the reason this reaction moves forward is because Q right now is equal to zero and Q must be equal to K in order for me to be at equilibrium. So for Q to get to K, I need these numbers to get smaller and I need this number to get bigger, which implies that the reaction is moving forward. So we'll do another example in a minute where calculating Q is going to be important. Right now it seems like, well, we didn't need to do all that. That seems like a lot of work to tell us that the reaction goes forward. And we already know that the reaction goes forward because there's nothing here. So yes, I agree with you. That's a lot of work to tell you something you already know. But it's important to get in the habit of calculating Q because sometimes it's not going to be so clear cut. So let's move on. The change for this reaction, remember the change is a function of the ratio. This is a 1 to 1 to 2. I know since I, we just went through that long spiel, my reactants are going to get smaller. By how much? By a factor of something, x. How much is this one? By the same factor, because it's a 1 to 1 stoichiometric ratio. And this is going to get bigger because it's the product. So it's going to get bigger plus, by how much is it going to get bigger? 2 times more than these, because this is a 1 to 1 to 2 ratio. So this is going to get bigger by 2x plus 2x. So my equilibrium is 1 minus x, 1 minus x, and 0 plus 2x. So let's just say 2x. We'll leave the 0 out of there to simplify our equation here. So what I'm trying to do is solve, this question is asking me, what's the equilibrium concentration? I want to know what these are. So really, this is kind of the question that I just did in the last one, too. I want to know what the equilibrium concentrations were so that I could solve KEQ. Except in this problem, I know KEQ, and I'm going to use that information to solve these equilibrium concentrations. So here's how we do that. We know that KEQ K -E -Q equals uh, products HF squared over reactants H2 times F2 and these are all remember when we're doing K we're talking about equilibrium concentrations equilibrium equilibrium these are my equilibrium concentrations these are my initial concentrations make sure you keep track of that so I'm plugging these into my K expression my HF equilibrium is 2x. So that HF equilibrium is 2x, but there's a squared here. Squared. What that means, you can see, is that the 2 in the stoichiometry uh, it pops up twice in the equation. Not only is it 2x, that 2 comes up here, but it's also raised to the second power. That 2 is also part of the equilibrium expression it's little c, right? So the 2 is both little c and it comes, it's factored into this x expression. So yes, the 2 appears twice. It's 2x squared. 
don't drop that square here. And on the bottom, we have 1 minus x, that's my equilibrium concentration of H2, and 1 minus x, that's my equilibrium concentration of F2. So now I know that KEQ equals 1.53. That's what I was given in the problem. So now I have this expression with all these x's equals 1.53. If I solve for x, and I know what x is, then I can come back up here and plug x into these expressions here, and I can calculate the equilibrium concentration of HF, or the equilibrium concentration of F2, or the equilibrium concentration of H2, any of them, if I know what x is, because it's the same x for all of them. So what I have to do is solve this equation right now. When we start getting into equations where I have a value of x squared, and I have a value of x, then we have to use what's called a quadratic equation to solve those expressions. They're algebraically pretty difficult to, ex to solve. So in this first video here, we're just looking at ice tables that involve calculations that don't require a quadratic. So some of these calculations will not require the quadratic. There's some tricks you can use. And some of these equations will require the quadratic. And we'll get, I'll cover those in another video. So for this one right here, we don't actually need to use the quadratic. Because even though it looks like I'm going to have a value of x squared, um, I can use some algebra shortcuts, some tricks here to make the squared go away. So I'm going to flip this around. 1.53 equals 2x squared. And another way to write this, 1 minus x times 1 minus x, another way to write this is 1 minus x squared, right? Because that's all squared means. It just means this times itself. So when I have 1 minus x times 1 minus x, I actually have 1 minus x squared. So now I've created an equation that looks like this, where I have a perfect square is what we call this. So that means that I can, if I take the square root of both sides of this equation, then the square root is going to eliminate the square on both of these values. So then what I'm left with is the square root of 1.53 equals 2x over 1 minus x. So now we have eliminated the x square by, use, by finding the square root of both sides. If I don't have an x squared value, I don't need to use the quadratic. So we can just use some basic algebra to solve this problem. So the square root of 1.53 is 1.237. And I'll move 1 minus x over to that side. Right, if I multiply 1 minus x times this side and 1 minus x times this side, then I'll remove it from this side. So then I have 1.237 minus, do this times 1, and then this times x, which is 1.237x equals 2x. So now we can move this back over to that side, plus 1.237x plus 1.237x. And then we have 1.237. 3, 7 equals 3.237x. And finally, x equals, try to divide both sides by 3, 2, 3, 7. So x equals 1.237 divided by 3.237 x equals 0 0.3821. All right, so now we have x, 0.3821. Go back up here, and remember, the question was asking. These are long problems, by the way, so it's OK for these problems take a long time to solve. 
it's asking what's the equilibrium concentration of HF? That's the question. Well now I know the equilibrium concentration of HF is equal to 2x. Now I know what x is. So the equilibrium concentration of HF equals 2x equals 2 times 0 0.3821 the concentration of HF equals 0 0.7642 molar. So to check to make sure we did this right, we can calculate, let's calculate the equilibrium concentrations of all of these species and make sure that they're going to add up that when we, when we plug them into this expression we get 1.53 right so the equilibrium let's calculate the equilibrium concentration of H2 which is 1 minus x which is 1 minus 0 0.3821 and F2 equilibrium equals the same thing, 1 minus x, so this equals 0 0.6179 molar. Zero point Six one seven nine molar. All right. Finally, let's plug this into our equilibrium expression and see if it gives us the equilibrium constant that we're supposed to get. So K E Q equals H F equilibrium squared divided by H two equilibrium times F to equilibrium. All right, HF equilibrium is 0 0.7642 molar squared divided by 0 0.6179 molar times 0.6179 molar, so they're the same, so squared. So KEQ really equals 0 0.7642 divided by 0 0.6179. One point five two nine five. One point five two nine five, which if we go way, way back up here, one point five three was the KEQ we were given. So these mu x must be right. This must be the right value for x because when I use x to solve for these equilibrium concentrations and I plug those equilibrium concentrations back into this expression, I get the same equilibrium constant, 1.53. All right, so let's look at another problem. Again, these are long problems and it's okay if it takes you a really long time. They are going to take a long time. All right, what is the equilibrium concentration of HF if the initial concentration of H2 is 1 and F2 is 1 and HF is 1. So rec you can recognize this is the same problem that we just did and the only thing that I'm changing now is the initial concentration of HF. It was 0 and now it's 1. So now it's not so clear cut. Which re way is this reaction going to move? If I have 1 and 1 and 1 does the reaction move forward and these get smaller and this gets bigger? Or does the reaction move backwards and this gets smaller and these get bigger? They're all equal to 1. None of them are equal to 0. So how do I answer this question? So this is why we have to solve Q. Q equals 
h f squared over h squared or h2 times f2. So h f is 1 and h, f, and f2 are 1 and 1, so q is 1. So now q equals 1, k equals 1.53. So q is less than k. If q is less than k, then which way does the reaction move? q has to get bigger. If q has to get bigger, the reaction is going to go this way, just like it did in the last one. The last one, q is equal to 0, smaller than k. Now q is equal to 1, still smaller than k. So it's going to move the same way. It's just not going to have to move as much this time. How much is it going to have to move? Well, let's figure that out. We have minus x, it's still moving that way, minus x, and we're going to gain 2x. So now we have 1 minus x, 1 minus x, and 1 plus 2x. So we're going to solve this the exact same way that we solved this last problem. KEQ equals HF squared over H2 times F2. And we plug in these equilibrium expressions. So 1 plus 2x squared. And because these two are the same, remember it's 1 minus x. 1 minus x, which is really just 1 minus x squared. Squared over 1 minus x squared equals 1.53. So again, we're with the situation where I can take the square root of both sides and eliminate this exponent. So then I have square root 1.53 equals 1 plus 2x over 1 minus x. And now we can solve this problem and solve for x and find the equilibrium concentration, just like we did in the last one. Except now instead of just solving 2x, now it's 1 plus 2x, because I already started with 1, and I'm going to gain a little bit more, plus 2x, whatever x happens to be. So I'm not going to go through all of the algebra again. We're just going to use algebra to solve that one. So I want to move on to the next one though because the next one's a little bit different. Alright, so when I say a little bit different, I mean it's just a little bit different. It's pretty much the same. So now we're starting with the same problem, same equation. Now I have one molar here, one molar here, and now I have two molar here. So you can see where I'm going with this maybe. We have to answer the question again. If I have 1 and 1 and 2, does the reaction move forward and these get smaller and this gets bigger? Or does the reaction move backwards and this gets smaller and these get bigger? Well, remember to answer that we have to solve for Q. So Q equals HF squared over H2 times F2, which is 2 squared over 1 times 1 which equals 4. So now Q equals 4. So now Q is greater than K. If Q is greater than K, then that means Q is too big, which means that the products are too big. So in order to make Q smaller, to make 4 equal to 1.53, now I have to make this number smaller and these numbers bigger. So in order to do that, the reaction moves this way. So it's always important to calculate k. If q is greater than k, oops. If q is greater than k, the reaction moves backwards. If q is less than k, the reaction moves forwards. If q is equal to k, reaction is at equilibrium, doesn't move, doesn't move. A reaction that is at equilibrium is already at equilibrium, it doesn't have to move to get to equilibrium. 
So these are our, your three situations when you're calculating Q and comparing it to K. So what do we do now that we recognize that this situation is different than our last situation? Now the reaction is moving backwards. It's not moving forwards. So if our reaction is moving backwards, how does that change what we're going to do? So where it changes it is right here in the change column. So let's draw our lines here again, separate reactants from products. So now, how is this going to change? Well, if this is moving this way, these aren't going to be minus anymore. Now these are going to be plus. If the, re if the reverse reaction is happening, these are actually the products, aren't they? It's still written as if they're the reactants, because they're on the left side. But if I'm getting more of them, then actually they're kind of like the products. And since the reaction is moving backwards, I'm saying that this is kind of like the reactant. So I'm going to lose, oops, I'm not going to only lose 1x, I'm going to lose minus 2x. So Q comes in right here. We have to consider Q when we're thinking about the C row of our ice table. If Q is greater than K, then it's going to be pluses on this side and a minus on this side. If Q is less than K, it's going to be minuses on this side and a plus on this side. All right, so now that we've made that small change, let's finish the rest of the table here. 1 plus x, 1 plus x, 2 minus 2x. So how do we solve for x? The same way we solved for x in the last ones. k is equal to hf squared divided by h2 times f2 so this equals now we fill in these new expressions 2 minus 2x don't forget your square over 1 plus x times 1 plus x which is 1 plus x squared and this is still all equal to 1.53 same reaction so I would take the square root of both sides and proceed to solve for x same way that we did for the last ones. We're just going to plug and chug through this algebra, just like we did in that first example. We're going to find out what x is, and once we know what x is, we're going to plug it back into this expression right here. 2 minus 2 times x, whatever x happens to be. And that will be our equilibrium concentration of HF.